Bobby, how you doing? How you doing, Johnny? I'm good. It's so good to be here with you, man. Well, I want to first of all, I want to congratulate you because this year you won both a Grammy and a Blues Music Award for your album Rawer Than Raw. Raw Than Raw. And that was pretty cool. You know, you're not even 90 yet, and you've already got this. I mean, you're doing great, you know? <laughs> and, John, I, I like you, Johnny. I like you, John. Now, you know, I said, well, how old are you? I said, well, I'm over 85. Yeah. I'm still on the 90. So that's, that's a pretty good range, you know? Yeah, John, I'm not good. I so thank you for having me on to talk about myself and where I've been and where I started from and where I am now and where I'm planning to go. You know? well, I want to ask you about the title of your book, I Ain't Studdin' You, My American Blues Story. It's also the name of one of your best-known songs and one of your albums. What exactly does that phrase mean, I Ain't Studdin' You? When someone says I'm not, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that I use as a child, and when you come to the hood, we're talking about the black neighborhood as a whole, everybody, most of them know what you talk about. That means I'm not thinking about you. Now, you probably say, if you're in... Uh, Buffalo, New York, someplace, some rural area, some social area. Someone said, well, I'm tired of you. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. But, but from where I come from, you said, I'm not studying you. I'm not thinking about you. Leave me alone. I'm not studying you. That means I'm not studying you. mean like, this is it. This is the end of the line. Do you like me? No, I don't like you. I'm, I ain't studying you. All I, right. I don't want to be bothered. You know, so how did this book how did this book come about? Uh, did you look for someone to tell your story, or did someone come to you and we say we want to hear your story? I kept telling my story on the bandstand through uh, different situations I was in, and someone kept saying, "Say, man, you ought to write this down. Uh, I'll tell this in a, a book fashion." It never uh, dawned on me about in a book because I started thinking about this because someone asked me about it maybe 15, 18 years ago. Could have been 20 years ago. But I didn't get serious about it until about seven years ago. I got serious about it. Then I got more serious at the time went by after Muddy Waters' death. Then come B.B. King, after B.B. King passed. Then I really thought I better put some things down because B.B. King came to me uh, about eight or nine months before he passed, he was working in his hometown in Denola, Mississippi. He said, Bob Rich, I want you to do me a favor today. I said, what do you want me to do today? He said, well, I don't really want you to do it today, but I want you to make your mind up to do something for me in, in June the 12th, this year. And the year he was talking about was five or six years ago. Yeah. I said, what is it, B.B.? He said, I want you to play in Denola with me. He said, because this is going to be my last time I play in the Nola. And I need you to help me draw black people to me. I said, B.B., you're the king of the blues. He said, yeah, but black people don't really follow me. You know, I've got a following, but uh, there's only about 10% of black people that follow me or less. I said, I'm already booked in Memphis, Tennessee that particular day. And the guy was paying me a good dollar. And I said, I don't think I can get out of him. He said, go talk to him. Ask him, can you do this for, for old BB? You know, I ain't talk. Yeah. I said, I will. I went to the promoter four or five days later. I said, listen, his name is, we call him D, a little D. I said, little D. I said, I'm doing a show for you on June the 12th. And you got me headlining. What if you let me work it? The open it up, it over, the gates open at four o'clock but I goes on like 10, 11 at night. I said, what if you let me come on early so I can do this for BB and, and uh, I'll give you a cut in price. In fact, I do it for half the money. He said, he helped his head down like this. He said, you'll do this for BB, huh? So he had given me half of my money deposit. He said, I tell you what, the gates open at four o'clock. You come down at four o'clock, and here's all your money that you gave me. Give, give me all the money you gave me back for my deposit. He said, and I'm going to pay the rest of it now, and you have all your money. Come play it. I know people won't be there, but play it. At least I won't make a lie out of myself. Everybody know you've been there, and you go play for BB. And I was off my feet. 
Mm. Didn't think he gonna do that. Now I didn't know BB was gonna pass a few months later. And that same year, the Blues Foundation gave me the BB King Award of the Year. And a few months later, he passed. After he passed at his funeral, the family asked me to have the last say so at the funeral after the preacher. Bobby Rush, how did I fit in this? And 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 on the way to the grave site in the hearse that he was riding in, he had me walking in, they had me walking in the front of the hearse on the way to the funeral home, on the way to the funeral home and to the burial ground. I don't think about this until the morning after that he was passing the torch to Bobby Rush. So I worked the last show with him. Yeah. I was the last man on the stage talking about him as a friend and as a musician and I'm my buddy buddy. And I was the first one in line walking in a hearse car to the grave site. But you know, that's, 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 that story that's in a great. way tells a lot about the whole story of the blues that the black audience has dropped off for it. And yes. Not, nobody, nobody, even as big as B.B. King hasn't seen that happen and he, no, need, no. he needed you to bring in more black people well let, let me let me say and i don't know some people know some don't know that i'm considered the king of the chitlin segment i'm the king of the chitlin so that means i got this black audience but for the last 15 or 20 years i've been crossing over to a white audience there's not many men set where i stand i got this big black audience and the white audience too. That don't that didn't happen to BB. He had a big white audience, but his black audience was small. Yeah. But now you have buddy guys the same way. He's, he don't have as big as, you know, you can go into an average neighborhood, talk to a 20, 25 year old black lady of Maine. They probably never heard of buddy guy. Uh, and, and that's, and I'm sitting in a position where you, but they'll know who I am. Bless them. Now, now, a lot of the white audience don't know me as well as the new buddy guy or B.B. King, but I'm getting there. But I'm one of the few guys who stand straddle the fence. Well, if you read I have, I have crossed over, but I haven't crossed out. If you That's read B.B. King's autobiography, he said it all happened around 1964, 65, that he had mostly a black audience and it all yeah. just seemed to turn over. Uh, his Live at the Regal album is, is pretty much all black audience. Yes. And that was 64. By 66, he was playing at rock festivals. You know, it just seemed to happen quickly. I want to go back to your early days because uh, you grew up in Louisiana. Yes. And the themes in your book talk about poverty. They talk about racism. They talk about music. And there seems to be a long story about you and your father. And yeah. now your name was Emmett Ellis Jr. My name and is Emmett Ellis Jr. You've never, I never actually changed it to Bobby Rush. No, what happened, my name is Emmett Ellis Jr. The only reason I wanted Bobby Rush because I because I was so close to my father and I believed in what he stood for spiritually, I didn't want any damage to his name as a preacher and a pastor of a church. And I could just see myself one day having this record of being this big artist. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmett Ellis is in town. And wouldn't nobody know whether it was my daddy, or me, <laughs> you know, and uh, as a junior or the senior. And I, I didn't want that because I, I respect my dad so highly because he was my everything of everything and all in all. He never told me to sing the blues, but he never told me not to. That was a green light to me because in the day, in the time that I came along, most of the people who had spiritual people's around them in their home, especially as a pastor and a preacher, they always talked about the devil music. My devil, my dad never talked about the devil music to me. He never came to see me perform. But he surely prayed for me. I know that. He never, he never came out to see you. No, he never came to see me play. Uh, and he taught me every little thing I know about the guitar. Well, in the book, you talk about getting a guitar. Yes. And about your, your being surprised that your father knew how to play it. I was surprised he knew how to play I was surprised he knew I even had it. My cousin and, gave me the guitar, and I hid it in a loft, like in a barn. 
where the sun was hot and it whopped the neck, man. The neck uh. whopped. I would every once a week I would go get it, call myself, sneak it out the barn, put it in this water trough where you beat the horses and cows. And it would sit in the water for a few hours. If the neck was straightened back out. Really? It like, yeah, it was straightened back out. So one day he said, he called me Junior. I'm named after my father. He said, Junior, come here, boy. I said, what is it, Dad? He said, bring that guitar here. You had it in the law. Now, I thought I had it hid. Oh, I was nervous because I thought he was going to whip me about it, scold me about it. I asked me to play some gospel song, and that I didn't want to play at all. I wanted to play the blues. So he said, let me play a little song I used to play to a little girl when I was a little older than you. He sit it down. He had old hot marker in his pocket. He'd been playing the old hot marker around the house. He pulled it out of his shirt pocket, sat on the dresser. He said, me and my gal went to Chanky Pin hunting. She fell down, and I saw something. I was like, wow. My daddy, this is your minister father. <laughs> my minister father, preacher, pastor of a church and my father. I said, sing it again, daddy. Now, what I want him to do, sing the next verse, because I thought maybe now he sung the first verse. She fell down. He saw something. I figured the second verse, he's going to explain what he saw. <laughs> I, couldn't ask my daddy, I couldn't ask my daddy what he saw. He said, me and my dad with the tanky pin hunting. She fell down and I saw something. I said, saying it again. By that time, my mother was in the kitchen cooking. Uh -oh. She said, me don't sing that song to the boy. He went to sing it again. And, and I said, daddy, daddy, how big was she? He was all 350 pound boy about that wide. I said, what she had on? He said, nothing but a dress, boy, nothing but a dress. <laughs> and I love mine. Big fat woman falling down. Nothing on but a dress. I'd imagine in my little mind, that was a lot to see. So mm -hmm. I said, he kept picking with it, get tired, start to sing it again. He said, me and my dad, we're just taking it, honey. So I looked around and saw my mom coming. I said, dad, dad, real low boys. I said, here come mama. He looked around, he said, me and my dad, we're just taking it, honey. She fell down and I kept running. So I don't know yeah. what the song would have been. Don't know what he saw. But in my little mind, I knew right then at seven, eight years old, what I wanted to be was a blues singer. Talking under the current, under the latest dresses about what I saw, what I wish I saw, what I thought I saw, I wish I could see. Well, that's pretty honest. Now let's let's talk about your mom a little bit because in the book you say that she was actually white. Yeah, and my mom. Let me my see if mom. I can make this. Let's see if I can get this picture to come up. I hope I can. Um, right at the moment, I'm not seeing where it went, but uh, oh no, <laughs> it's here somewhere. Um, there's a picture of you and your and your father and your mother that comes from your documentary. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I guess I I don't. Uh, at the moment, I'm not seeing it. I don't know where it went. But she she does look white. Was she white? Was she? Uh... Well, well, at the later later in life, she didn't look as white as she did when she was 30, 35, maybe 42 years old. But I can remember, uh, like yesterday, when she had to, she was my babysitter when we was in public. And she was my mama when she got home. My daddy was her chauffeur when we was out in public. But he was a chauffeur when he was out in the, in the public, you know. And I can remember now going to the store for my mom, and my mom could be white when she wanted to, when she had to be, or whatever it was, whatever the situation was. But then I remember she sending me to the store to get some food, milk, or whatever, whatever she wanted me to to have. I'll get for her. And she would tie the money up in a little purse. Well, she tied up a little purse and a little handkerchief, or whatever little rag I had in my hand. And I noticed a few times when I got back home, the same money that she sent me to the store with was still in the was still in the tied up in this little rag. So that uh -huh. tells me that she had a relationship with the people in the store, could get what she wanted, uh, while my daddy wasn't around. And my mom was a kind of person who 
at a young age, you just couldn't tell what she would wind up like, you know. I don't know if you can see the picture now. The, there's a picture which I'm putting up of you with very long hair and your, uh, mother, and your mother and father uh, that comes from your, your documentary that you put out on your own uh, company. As, as my mama got older, she uh, kind of went to the white head and kind of dyed her hair from the blonde. So she, I don't know what she was trying to describe herself so she could look blacker, uh, what she was trying to do as she got older. But when she was young, uh, you just really couldn't tell uh, at some situation what she was black or white. But wasn't there really like a prohibition against interracial marriage back then? I don't oh, think yeah. That, there were laws against it. Well, you know, the law is different now, but everything has changed, but everything still remains the same. Because you can change the law of uh, how you should treat a person, but you can't change the heart of a person how they should treat you. So a, a lot of things have changed, but a lot of things still remain the same. Uh, it's just it's just in the law book, you can't do certain things, but that don't mean don't, they don't want to do it. And because uh, if, I, if I had wrote this book uh, just a year later, maybe I would have said some things about what happened in the White House just a year and a half ago when they marched on the White House. So I'll let you know that a lot of things have changed, but a lot of things remain the same. A lot of people have feel different about me as a black man, but a lot of people feel the same thing about me as a black man, good or bad. But uh, I want people to read this book for a lot of reasons. The first reason is because I've had my up, my down, my valleys, my hills, my high, my lows. But the good overtake the bad. I want everyone to know when you read this book, don't feel sorry for me. Just try to do things to other people that you wish how you want them to treat you. Treat people like you wish to be treated. Plus, I want you to go away saying, if Bobby Rich can make it out of this he went through, I can too. That's the message. Well, let's let's talk let's talk about how you made it. Now, one of the things you do in the book a lot is fake your age. <laughs> yeah. Being That's older not, than you were. So you can not just not, so you can get into clubs, but also so you can work. And you had a trick for making a fake mustache. What was that? Did it, did it really work? When I was about 14, I got my first job working in the club when I was about 14 years old. 14, 15, working on a rabbit foot. And I have to act like a I was a uh, oh, oh, yeah, miniature show, what they call yeah. it. It's a rabbit foot. It's yeah. really nothing but a carnival. You know, yeah. now a carnival. And I had to be 18 years old to work there. So I put my age up in order to work. Then I, I would take matches, scratch it, and blow it out till I get me about eight or 10 of them to suck off the matches. I would mark my mustache like that, like a full main shoe, cut it up. You know, I look look kind of Spanish. And I would <laughs> full main shoe. And I would do that, put me a cap on my head, to hold my head down, walk up like I was a little, little old man. And I got by with that. There was a few people who made a knew it. And, but I got by with it, put my age up when I was 15 to 18. Then the second thing is that I really didn't have any sound proof how old I was because I left Louisiana in 1947. And in them days and time, I was had a midwife with my doctor. I was born at, at home. Yeah. And they had this, some records weren't quite straight. But I had someone say, I was born 1940. Some said 1941. One man said 1936. One said 1933. One said 1937. So I took the 37 lately, but I tried to take the 1940. That's the one I wanted. But I mm. couldn't get enough of people <laughs> to say 1940. Because I had to go down to the courthouse. You had to have some witnesses approved about about your age, and that's what they kind of went with, you know. Okay. Uh, but I knew I left Louisiana in 1947. Went to Pine Bluff, Arkansas with my father, 1947. In 1951, I was working at Rabbit Foot, and that's the year I moved to Chicago, went to Chicago, and came back and moved out last from 52 or 53 to stay for good. So before, before you went to Chicago, you met a woman named Hazel. Yeah. You got married. Hazel Adam. Yes. And what happened? It's uh, a hard story to hear, especially about the kids. 
Yeah, I met Hazel. She had three sisters, Ruby, Faye, Freda Faye. Three sisters was like six, seven, eight years old. We just got married. So we moved to Chicago, got married in Chicago, had a house in Chicago. And they moved in with me, so to her mother and father. And then after her father passed, her mother passed, we had three children. Uh, my old, old, my baby in the middle child passed, was with a girl, Sherry. She passed. Then the next child was 18 years old. She passed, which would have been six to eight years old today that she'd have been living. Then my oldest son, which was the next to the oldest child, he passed. Then the wife passed. That was all of that family. Three children, mom, father-in-law, and mother-in-law. Then the three sisters of her, which was my sister-in-law, but they thought I was their father because all they knew was me is coming up. Uh, but the, the, three, the three kids that you had all died of sickle cell, didn't they? Sickle cell anemia. And did you did you find out along the way what how that works? How it, two people yeah, have to have after, 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 after a while, because uh, I was a carrier, and so we see, but sometimes carrier uh, makes a anemic child, and we didn't know that. But when I found that out, I was I kind of quickly educated myself to not to try not to have any more children, you know. Then I got married again and had one other child. He was. Uh, blessed to be perfectly healthy, and uh, he's 56 years old now, and uh, assistant chief of police in Jackson, Mississippi. Been really? For 17, 18 years, and uh, he's the baby and my only child now for living. Then I have four grandchildren and three great great grandchildren. Wow. Um, but it all, but it's all through this one son who survived. Yeah. One son survived. How did you? That's just so painful to think about these kids dying, not just yeah, one. It, it's so painful. It's so painful, but I've been through so much. I got so many things. Not as painful as losing a child, but somewhat just as painful. Because when I left Louisiana to go to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Pine Bluff, Arkansas with my father, the racial thing that we couldn't eat. I go to school in the same place that white people went. We had yeah. a white fountain and a color fountain. It wasn't black at that time. It was a color. And and we couldn't go to hotels and things like that. And I said, I'm going to go to Chicago because I had met Mother Water and Hollow Wolf. They were talking about the, the experience in Chicago, how free it was, how they had so much freedom. I said, man, I got to get to Illinois. Got to get to Illinois. So I didn't have enough money to buy myself a ticket to go to Chicago. So I bought myself a ticket to go to Memphis, Tennessee, where B.B. King was working on Bill Street and Rufus Thomas, son of Barry Williams, was in Helena, Arkansas. So I knew these three guys, and I got to meet other musicians and other entertainers along the way. And I made enough money on Bill Street to get to East St. Louis, where Chuck Berry and Albert King was and Red Fox. So then I made enough money of that to get to Chicago. Well, Muddy Water, Howlin' Wolf, uh, John Lee Hooker, Jimmy Reed, Bo Diddley, Lil Walter, all these guys were there at Chess Records. And I thought, said, I'm at Chess Records now. I'm gonna make a better life for myself, have a chance to record, and, and, and just, I'm in heaven now. But J.B. Lenore and Muddy Water invited me to a place and showed me what place was in the suburb, Blue Island, Illinois, where I went and got a job with a guy making $7.50 a night, me and the band, mm -hmm. $7.50 a night. So I worked there for, for a while, but, when, but how I got this job, when I got the job, I had to go around to the back. There was a white club, an all-white audience, they had me playing behind a curtain where they wanted to hear my music, but they didn't want to see my face. That's crazy. All of a sudden, <laughs> in my mind, what I was looking for to be free, 
I'm not praying now. And I tossed with that for many, many years, like 40 something years. And my, I was, although I was in the southern, although I was from the southern state, living in Chicago, but I always stayed in my mind that I didn't have my freedom where I thought I was going to be free. So I wound up going back to the roots of Jackson, Mississippi, where my great great granddaddy and mother was from, which was a guy called Van Spivey who lived in the house with, with, with her boss who was a slave. He had six kids by her and five by his wife in the same house. So I was told when he was on his dying bed, he wanted to, to buy his land to his siblings, to his children. And the white side of the family, which was half brother to my great grandma, took them to Eudora, Arkansas and brought them off in a big barn in a field. That's where they raised themselves. That's how my dad met my mom from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm now I'm born in Louisiana because that's where they was dropped off. But my roots is Mississippi. But now you, you made a re, what, what most people would consider a reverse move. You were in Chicago and you went to Jackson, which I want to ask you about. But before I want to stay in Chicago for a bit because you did some things to help you make money. You were supporting a lot of people, right? Your wife's family and all these people and. You did a few things. Uh, you had a hot dog stand. You had a bar <laughs> you had a barbecue place, which I guess a lot of musicians have done in Chicago, and it kind of went boom, didn't it? I didn't want no, but yeah, boom, but it really boom, it blew up. It actually blew up, and and you were hurt, weren't you? I was hurt, burned. Uh, probably sixty percent of my body was burned. Wow. So I was young. <laughs> oh yeah, I was young, and my skin was drafted off of my arm. To the side of my face, they did a great job with me. Yeah, you don't uh, look bad. <laughs> yeah, and uh, cause I was burnt real bad, man, and I, my heart was hurting. I was burnt, and uh, but the barbecue itself was doing decent. But I was, but I was going into barbecue business. But I was neglecting what I was, what I wanted to do was be an entertainer, play my guitar, and blow hard. Mm -hmm. But uh, but then. I was still burning inside of what I need to do and what I want to, what I want to, where I want to go. So I decided I would sell. Well, I'm in Chicago, but most of my work is in the Southern State, in the Chilean Circuit, in the good, in, in the country, in the Chilean Circuit, because it wasn't that much work for me to get the big money in Chicago, because I had my competition, Muddy Waters, Hollywood, Little Richard, Jimmy, Jimmy Reed. That's dumb enough. They all, the big boys had to tie it up. So I had to get out and go to the countryside and get me some gig. So I was going, I believe, on a Thursday night, coming to Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama. And I would get that on a Friday. And I would work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, leave out on Monday, come back to Chicago, get Chicago on a Tuesday, stay in Chicago two days out again. I said, no, this got to be crazy. Let me move back down south where I could work Friday, Saturday, Sunday and won't be 200 miles from home and come back and be home Monday morning with my children and my family. And, and it's easy on me financially and everything else. And that's what I decided to do, along with want to look for my roots, of my people, of who I was and who my people was. And, 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 and it pays off. It paid off. It paid off. So you moved to Jackson. Yes. Yes. And but after, after, after I'm in Philadelphia, cut records in Philadelphia with Kenny Gamble, Leon Up, with the Philadelphia National Records, I cut yeah. about maybe 11, 12 songs. Uh, well, let's talk uh, about your records a little bit, because before you did that, you, you recorded Chicken Heads. Yes. That, that's the song a lot of people still remember and know you by. You say, but you rush to go, oh, Chicken Heads. Yeah, yeah. You know? Here's what a lot of people don't know. I would cut the record in 1968. But it didn't hit until 1970 or 71 because I was struggling trying to get it on the label. I was on my own top label, which was a local label with Calvin Carter, who had BJ Records. But I wasn't on BJ Records. I was on this, this small label. He was trying to get it off the ground. BJ Records had went bankrupt, so they were like, starting from scratch. But then when Fantasy picked it up, the record just boomed. And uh, some said it. 
it went to number 16 in chart, but I can tell you now, it went to number one in a lot of charts. Mm-hmm. I really had the number one or two record in England. The Beatles had the number one. Jane Brown had the number two record. And Bill Withers had the number three record. And they beat out them guys. And that time... So do you want to say do you want to say anything about what that song's about? Yeah, I could. <laughs> chicken heads. Well, chicken heads. It wasn't chicken heads when I cut the record. The title was Chick Head. That was a guy who was a preacher called Leo Arstell, was a friend of uh, Calvin Carter. So when I came to, he said, "Bobby Rush, you've been asking me about cutting a record on you for many, many years. Said, I'm gonna cut a record on you. Get me some." Give me some sound. Let me hear it. I said, I have a record now. He said, what is it? I said, Chick Head. And he laughed. So the preacher would listen to him. He said, Chick Head. Oh, we can't cut no record like that, Bobby Rick. <laughs> what? Chick Head, man. We, 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 that's X-rated. But I hadn't thought about what I was saying. I was just saying Chick Head. You know? He said, well, how do the song go? I said, go like this. Daddy told me on his dying bed, Give up your heart, don't lose your head. You came along, girl, what did I do? I lost my heart and my head too, which had nothing to do with a chicken. He <laughs> said, he said, oh, you from down south. Y'all eat chicken heads down there, don't you, boy? I said, yes, sir. Then he thought about the chicken, which I wasn't talking about a chicken. He said, yeah, we can cut this record, but we got to have the B-side. B-side was another song. I said, I got another song. So what's the name of it? I said, Mary Jane. He said, oh, yeah, Mary Jane. I had a girl when I was in high school. Man, did me, did me, <laughs> sing about her. And I wouldn't talk about a girl at all. It was I about talk, marijuana. I was talking about marijuana. Yeah. You know? And so these guys didn't know what I was talking about. Chick here, they didn't know. Marijuana, they didn't know. I said, oh. I got <laughs> so that, was your first, that was your breakthrough record. That was my first break to get the big record. I had records before that. Yeah. But not that big. But Chicken Head just... All the way, and then uh, people started looking at me as a entertainer, as a writer, and a producer because uh, Calvin Carter had the uh, credit for producing, but he didn't produce it. I produced it. That that's happened to me with Jane Bennett, who I cut maybe a hundred records uh, with the Jam label. So since since we're talking about Mary Jane marijuana, and and we'll talk about drinking these days when a musician writes a book like yours telling their life story, it seems like it's always, at some point, they had a drinking problem or they had a drug problem. Somehow you've managed totally to avoid that. How many drinks have you had in your life now? I had three beers in my lifetime. Wow. 1957, I had them with muddy waters. I haven't had one before or since. I don't even smoke a cigarette, no kind, no reaper, no get high, no form of fashion. Now I do a whole lot of things, but it ain't that. Uh, Carl, this book is is about the truth of me. Cause I got a couple lies in the book. One of them is that I I said I wouldn't sleep with a fat woman no more. I lied about that. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. I lied about that. But 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 you know, overall, I wrote the book because I wanted to tell this story about me. Cause I know this story relates to so many guys like me who never told the story. I, and I know a lot of guys like a BB and the guys who in my age bracket and older, they never talked about they working behind a curtain. They never talk about some of the racial things, of the up and down, the bad, the good, the heel, the things I've done. I've done some terrible things, man, in order to survive. In order for me to survive, that was some things I went through. But I want the world to know when they read this book, I'm not the only man that had it hard. I went through hard trials and tribulations because there ain't many men who have crossed this road that I crossed and survived it. Not even a Sam Cook. He got killed for what he stood for. Ray Charles didn't die early, but he also got tricked early. I believe that B.B. King had to do some of the things he had to do because his management and record company the thing because I'm I'm saying that because I know what what was offered to me as a black man. And we're gonna find out that Prince just didn't die. We're gonna find out some years from now 
that Michael Jackson just didn't die. That was all the pressure. I can understand the Floyd uh, who accused of dying or uh, got killed because of because of police knee, knee on his neck. Yeah. But you're looking at a man been had a knee on my neck for 70, at least 79 years of it since I was a little two or three old boy. Well, you know, there there's a story in the news here recently about a, a guy who went to jail for 30 plus years for a crime he didn't commit. He confessed to it and they talked about how the police managed to get those confessions. You have never been a drug user, but you went to jail for drugs. Why? And why did you go to jail? Because in the book it says you were offered a chance to do community service instead of prison and you chose to go to prison. Because I didn't want nobody to see me on the street like all oh, the respect they had for me. Then 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 the people who was inside the business, they already know that I wasn't no drug dealer. They already know. But some of the things I talk about it now because I've taken it because I had to take it to save my life. My life was online. So they were they were pressuring you to be Oh yeah. My be, life was online. Yeah. That's pretty scary stuff. So you were busted. Yeah, it's, it's, it's scary if you do. It's scary if you don't. Uh, I got by with a lot of things in earlier in my life and recording why because that was some record company thought that I knew Al Capone because I worked for the Al Capone <laughs> composition. They thought I didn't know Al Capone, but I used it to my advantage. And, and they thought I knew Al Capone as a young boy. Wake up, they thought I would back up home. What you think the dope dealer would come and ask me? Because they thought I would be in, in Chihu, I knowing about everything that I didn't know. And, and and I was the guy who pretend I know and didn't know anything, just enough for them to pay me for the for the information. Mm -hmm. That ain't right either. That ain't right either. It sounds very scary, actually. Yes, it's scary. It's, it's a scary situation. Uh, it's a scary situation now. It's just that I have lived a life I'm like Martin Luther King now. I have seen the mountaintop. I have seen the promised land because I have did anyone in a harm in it but myself because the lies I told about it and the things I've done was to get me ahead and try to stay alive. Because I know if I had said who it was, my life wouldn't have been. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the two Bobby Rushes. It seems like, and you said yourself, you were switching over and, and getting some white audiences, but still playing the Chitlin circuit. That is the series of clubs, mostly in the South and other places that are black owned and that mostly serve black people. You're doing these two things now, right? You're doing both. And are you different? Are you a different person at one than the other? A different performer? No, I, I, I'm the same person. It's just when I'm done for the in the past, I did things when I was done it for all black audience. I had the band around me, but story wise, it was the same thing. I'm still just crucial guy who playing by myself, who added musician around to help me play it. Now it's a lot of time I'm stripping the other things away from around me and still talking the same talk, the same song. Same everything, you know. I, the story is the same. The approach is different. Uh, it's almost like mortification. It's almost like when I was a boy, when I was a child, we didn't have no inside toilet, inside bathroom. We had to go outside to go to the toilet, to the bathroom. And it smelled bad, looked bad. But now I have nine or ten bathrooms inside of my house. Smells good, look good, but what you do in them is the same. That happened, James. Mm -hmm. So what I did with my song, my story is the same. It's just the ingredient that I put around it makes it different because when I'm doing things back in the past for black radio, I have to make it commercially where sound good enough of something that the program or record could relate to where I am. And most of the time, I knew the program director. I knew this this black guy. I don't know what he liked. He probably in my age bracket. I kind of know what he liked, what he don't like, and I kind of play to his 
to his uh, to his head level. And the, now I don't try to play to nobody's head level. And it, and, it's, and I can see guys now saying, "I'm going to cut a record like this because I think this is what white people like." Well, let me let I'm me. Gonna say, I'm going to cut a record like this because I think it's what black people like. I try to cut good record and hope everybody like it. Not a black and white yeah. issue yeah. with me. Well, let, let's let's. We're we're getting to a point now where we should take some questions from the audience. Okay. So I'm going to see what we got here. Um, this one is from Roger. Awesome talk, guys. Bobby, is there any way you could play us a song on your harp? <laughs> Maybe something quick so we can get the other questions. Someone in. asked me, so why do you sing the blues? Is it because your woman left you? Yes, you can have the blues if your woman leave you. But you can also have the blues if they stay too long. Let me show you what I mean. Huh? Have you ever been mistreated by someone you showed up love? Have you ever been mistreated by someone you showed up love? Out of all the men my woman could have left me for, she left me for the garbage man. If I ever get my woman to come back home, I'm gonna buy myself a garbage truck. If I ever get my woman to come back home, I'm gonna buy myself a garbage truck. And when my garbage can't get full, I'm gonna take it and dump it way, way out in the woods. All right, a song for Roger there. We got some other questions. Uh, here's one from Barbara. Good evening, Dr. Rush. Congrats on your book. What is the most important takeaway from your book? By the way, this is Barbara Thomas from the Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts, looking forward to purchasing your book. So the question is, uh, what is the most important takeaway from your book? I think you can take where I've been, what I've done, the hills I've climbed, the hills I fall, the valley I've been in, I didn't wallow in the, in the fall that I fell. I didn't do everything just right to do, but one thing for sure, I got up and learned from my mistakes. And if you take what I've said in this book, get out of this, do the same thing, you will learn that you can do it too, and you can make it if you try. I think that is one of the themes in your book. And I remember at one point you say, it's okay to grieve, but not drown. That's right. Yeah. When you were talking, I guess, about the, the deaths of your kids. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay to cry, but you don't, you don't, you know, and, and I cried and, and I cried and I cried, uh, but, but, but that's not the end of the road. When you cry, that just showing that you're human and uh, get up and walk. Come on, get up and walk because it's not the end of the world. And, and we got to be strong for each other. I know sometimes it seems rough and tough, but even in, when I'm down, I think about what it could have been. I'll yes. be thankful for what it is. Let's ask let's uh, ask Jim's question here. It says, you met Elmore James early on, which is true enough. What can you tell us about his style, about how his style progressed? Oh God, I, I, I really don't know how it progressed, but I'll tell you what, how it progressed on me. The more I look at him, the more complicated it seemed to play what he played because he was a slide genius on, on the guitar. Yeah. And that's why, that's why I did one of the songs, you know, God, get up in the morning, dust my broom. Oh man, I did it several different ways, but man, I'm gonna get up in the morning, da -da 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 -da. oh ooh, God. What a player. This one yeah. part in the book, though, where, where you and he are both auditioning, and they <laughs> tell him he's great, but then they don't hire him, and they hire well, you. But, you know, if, 
I never played with Elmo James, but Elmo James played with me. Yeah. That's the, that's the <laughs> thing I can say. Elmo James was doing this audition for the rabbit foot, and they turned him down. He and a few other guys turned him down. So the guy come up and said, after they turned out all these guys down, they went, and, and I'm going to tell you this kind of short way. So the two guys were saying, what are you here for, boy, talking to me? I said, I'm here to get an audition. So what you do? I was afraid to tell him that I play guitar. I just saw him turn the M.O. Jane down. He <laughs> played rings about me, man. Yeah. And I didn't want to get fall in that trap. I said, I do a lot of things. So what you do? And I got up and I said, ham bone. A ham bone. <laughs> yeah, stop popping my mouth. He said, you high. <laughs> I put my band together that day and hired Elmo Jane in my band. You That's hired him. All yeah. right. Now I got now I got the Bobby Rush and Fo Java, Elmo Jane playing the band. Cause he didn't play for a few weeks, but I can say I hired Elmo Jane. That is incredible. That is um, amazing. Here's a question from Ann about your first guitar, the one your cousin gave you. Did that yeah. first guitar, the one the one that went from the loft to the trough? influence the way you play the guitar? Did the guitar yeah, think, influence your style? <laughs> well, yeah, I have, a, because I'm a bass player also. And if you notice, I, I probably didn't notice, but if you listen to Raw and Raw, you would swear it's two guitars playing there. But it's not an overdub, it's me playing. That's the way I play, like it's two guys playing. I got my thumb down the bass, do, 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 and my thing, other fingers going, playing the guitar. And my, my, and my thumb is my bass because I'm a bass player. And I got this kind of rhythm going. It's like rubbing your head and patting your stomach at the same time. Then I got this rhythm thing going with, with, against the rhythm with my mouth and my song. That approach. B.B. King told me, I don't see how you do it, man. I can't do all them things at one time. But I learned to play like that because I had no, when I was young, I had nobody to play with, no band, no, nobody to play bass while I do the guitar line. So I had to do all at the same time. So that's why you hear this record sound like two guys playing it, you know? So that's where my style comes from. Well, you know, I actually don't think that B.B. King could play and sing at the same time. Well, he, he was saying he, he could not. He, he would sing, sing and then he would play and then he would sing. Yeah, play and sing. He plays, yeah. like, it's, it's plays. But I can do, I'm pretty good at it. God done bless me. I'm pretty good, pretty good at it because I had nobody to help me. I had no band. I had no bass player, a piano player. Or somebody to do other parts while I do my little lead part. You know, like Elmo Jane do his lead, da, 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 da. and somebody else got the other going. I had nobody around me in my neighborhood. None of my brothers and sisters could play an instrument. So I had to be all these people in, uh, in one hand, you know. Now, here, here's a question which I was going to ask you. We've been kind of running out of time on some of this, but it comes from Michelle. And it's something that people talk to me about sometimes. They either love it or hate it. <laughs> but uh, Michelle says, where did you get the idea to have dancers in your show? And we uh, should talk about what these dancers do, right? Yeah, I, I can tell you. It's part of the entertainment because me as a black man, I come from the Cap Calloway setting because I love Cap Calloway, Louis Jordan, and people like that. Black people always had this entertainment. The Sammy Davis Jr., the Bobby Ray, we always had this thing, this entertainment thing. And this is part of the entertainment from way back from African days, the girls dancing. So I just, it ain't nothing new to me as a black man, but it's something new to the white people. Why did I do that? Because I want to entertain. This is my way of entertaining. This is my Broadway show in the ghetto. This is my Broadway. This is my Las Vegas road show in the ghetto. So it's it's a no brainer to me, you know. Had the girls up there so the so the guys can can wink and blink at the girl. But in the meantime, I thought I was handsome enough to get the girls to blink and blink <laughs> at me. So it was an even Stephen kind of a thing. Well, let me see if I can let me see if I can find one of those. Um, I don't know if it doesn't come up quickly, I won't. But uh, well, let's see about this one. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Um, you can see this uh, to see what your dancers do. All right, here we go. This was recorded in 2013 at the Pocono Blues Festival. Three times a day. But old hands every time, man. Three times a day. Three times a day. 
So that's a little bit of a uh, <laughs> <your> show. <laughs> now, 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 if you're wrong, it's not a little bit of the show. That's a, <laughs> a little bit, you can take a little bit off of it. I'm trying to get it to go off right now, but it's not going off. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, all right, I guess that's it. Um, throw your shoe at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that that's kind of what it is, the dancers that you've got. Yeah, yeah, it's not really a dance. It's a, it's it's about a show, and and and, and the girls got the the big ring, and I do that intention, and I and I do that intention. I pick the one who who looks like that because I'm not looking for the cutie pie. I'm looking for I'm just it's about a show. Looking for something you can laugh and joke and, and care on about. It. Although these ladies is is somebody's child. And they have children. They're somebody's mother, and 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 on and on and on. They're not just dancers. They're human beings, and, and they have fun and they're making a living doing what they do, and they're good at what they do. And I and, and I kind of pick the size of them in the whole bit, and I kind of do the routine out in my head, so I kind of take it the way I think I want it to go because it's 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 a it's funny and it's a joke, you know. And uh, it's. It's not smutty. <laughs> no, no, no. But, nope. but everybody can relate to that because, uh, because just because they're not the skinny lady, model-looking lady, that don't mean they're not uh, worthy of uh, having desire to have a good life for themselves, like like the little cuties, skinny ladies do. You know. Mm. Betty says, "Will you be coming to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania?" She says she got the book on Kindle. Thanks, you are so wise, and your story is crucial. The answer will be: Are you coming to Philly? Are you? Yeah, I, I talked to a gentleman uh, today. In fact, I uh, hope for the next, if the virus be well, I hope to do it around the Christmas time, the holiday time. But all we're waiting on now is the virus to get settled, make sure that we safe. I'm safe for them. They safe for me. We safe for each other. That's all we're waiting on. Then I'll be back to Philadelphia. And Barbara says, "Are your songs based on your life? And will we find this out in the book?" Yes, <laughs> yes, you sure will. You're gonna find out that all the things I've done in in real life. When you read this book, you gonna say, "Yeah, I can see why he did that." Yeah. I I know you have a song. Some of your more recent songs, you've been calling it folk funk. And well, I, I really I love the sound of those songs, like Uncle Esau. Uh, the guitar sound is, is really rich. The harmonic is rich. Uh, it's just you. Most of them are solo. Yeah, but, but see, the folk funk, I didn't know what to call this. And I was talking to a promoter, and I talked to a uh, host from a radio station. I said, Bobby Rich, you're funky, you're bluesy, you rock, you're a little rollish. You live this, you live that. I don't know what to call you. I guess I just call you folk funk. So I ran <laughs> with that and I laughed about it. So I'm focused, I'm funky, and you know, a little whatever, you know. And then you, you hear a little, you get the hook and I get the pole, baby. You get the hook and I get the pole. We go down to the quad at home, honey, baby, mine. You hear a little that in me, you know? Yeah. Uh, some, some, it's about music and what I love and uh, what I display, you know? And I tell it in a jokey fashion way, and then then the rappers relate to what I do because it's it's got that swiftness thing inside of it. Then I then I speak so many words in a, in, a, in, a, in a in a verse of a song, and the rappers kind of like that because it's a lot to remember. But man, I say a lot of things. Man, Chuck Berry was the same way. Chuck Berry, oh God, a song. You have two pages of the song. Yeah, they were covered. Uh, yeah, I have 397 records, and I remember most of them. 
because I wrote most of the stuff, you know. So now the, the reactions of the audiences, you have black and, and white audiences, are they different? Are they pretty much the same? They pretty much the same. I had to approach a little bit different when I first started crossing over. But now people into Bible verse, not so much of the music that I'm crossing over with. They they kind of, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I have this, this name that I can do a few things I couldn't do earlier on in my career. Because people knows that some of the things I do on stage is a joke. They know I'm not serious about a lot of things I say, but they, they know I'm, but they know I'm serious about my music and how good I want to be at it. And uh, it's yeah, because I remember when about 60 years ago, could have been a little less, could have been a little more, when they invented a wah wah so the white guys could sound like the black guys. <laughs> now you got black guys buying wah wah trying to sound like a white guy who's trying to sound black. So so that's all that's in that scene, but then on the rap scene and the uh RB level, you got guys look up to me and looking at me and watching what I do. Not only just me, a few other guys do. Cause if it wasn't and the rappers should have watched me. Cause if it wasn't for Bobby Rush, it probably wouldn't be no fifty cent, be a dime a quarter or something like that. <laughs> well, I think oh, we're just about much. We're just about out of time from what I can understand. Bobby, thank you so much for taking time with me. Well, thank you and for having me. And I want people to go out and get this book, read this book, and go away not feeling sorry for me. Just grabbing hold of yourself and saying, if he did it, so can I. The book is called... Friend, the book is called I Ain't Studying You, My American Blues Story. It's by Bobby Rush with Herb Powell. And uh, Bobby uh, is, uh, I, can't book, I can't tell you how much we haven't talked about. You really have to read the book. We missed yes, a lot. <laughs> oh, God. There's, but, there's so much in there that we didn't touch, touch bases on. That's why it was so hard to write a book about my life. Now, you need three books to complete my life, you know. So thank you very much. I don't thank know if Andy's again. coming back or not. But thank you, Bobby. It's been great well, talking thank to you. Thank you. Tell Anne, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Thank you for what you have done, what you're doing, what you plan to do. God bless. All right. Good night, Bobby. Good night, man.